we've been in this series together. We've been talking through some things, and and uh, we're, of course, in that season as, as people and as in our families of getting gifts and getting last-minute gifts and trips to the store and, and buying things on Amazon. And uh, I, I know a lot of people, we saw kind of even in our own society and culture this year, I mean, it's, it, we kind of see it shifting, but this last year we noticed, especially around like Black Friday, this major shift of how people purchase things where there, there was a time where people would storm the gates right of Walmart or storm into Best Buy, and now it's like they open the door on Black Friday and like one person walks in, right? And they just have the whole store to themselves. We've seen this shift of people now purchasing online, and, and it's fascinating. I was reading up a little bit this week. Uh, in 2019, uh, Amazon brought about this, this kind of new idea of, 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 of allowing people to do business with them. They had kind of integrated this, this new practice into their business and the, and the way that they ran their e-commerce that, frankly, no other company had ever done. And it was quite, quite risky, too. They had already had some pretty lenient return policies before, but in December of 19, they brought about what we all very much love, the no-hassle, free return, no-questions-asked policy that they have had for the last two years. They've seen their, their, their sales boom, and they've seen uh, things just skyrocket, and even other big stores have even followed suit, allowing people to have such flexible, easy to return, because, because this idea of wanting to allow people to have some sense of confidence in their buying um, with the ability to, to, to return it if they didn't like it. And they found even, like, s- people are 70% more likely to purchase something if they know they can easily return it, even if it means they're spending a few more dollars. They're willing to purchase something that costs a little bit more. Even if we know that, we can just easily return it. No questions asked. We click at a button, and you drop it off at UPS, or you take it to an Amazon store, whatever it is. Easy peasy. Well, what began as this idea to bring confidence to the buyer has turned into a crisis for the company. Because actually, it's fascinating. In the last few years, they've seen returns incrementally and, and radically increase where people are purchasing and returning. And, and, and over the course of a few years, they've seen it grow from 3 4 5% of the items bought would be returned. And, and it jumped Christmas of last year to over 20 22%. Wow. That one in five items last year bought on Amazon was returned. And then now there's all these people who are talking that now we'll see it even go into one in three. That come January, the very people who were working their tail off to deliver our presents in the first place are now going to spend all their time returning them because we changed our mind. <laughs> but it's done something in our society, this unique shift that's happened, where we have kind of similarly in, in our experience with drive through fast food, where we can pull up to a, a, a speaker, say what we want, or we can even now press a button on our phone and, and roll right to the window and reach out the car and bring it in and keep on rolling. As Google search engine has now become our main way of learning new things and we can Google anything and everything to learn something we don't know, we have now become this culture. We've seen how these ways have really impacted our mind and and our way of wanting to gain information and and wanting to have no sense of resistance in trying to learn new things. We have now become a people who have become so custom to allow the things that don't turn out to be what we expect them to be, to be so easily undone. And so when that Amazon box shows on the front porch, we open it up, we change our mind, or we use it for 29 days, and then we return it on day 30. <laughs> We've become so easy with this idea of not really putting much forethought into a decision. Because now there's all this leniency on the other side. And you see, as we've seen other things in the market that have impacted our way of living, we've become a people who, when we find ourselves in moments where things aren't quite lining up like we hoped, it's not quite as easy to undo like an Amazon return. And we become people with expectations set by businesses and patterns in the world. And we naturally allow those things to sprinkle into our everyday life 
and they especially sprinkle into the parts of life that can't be so easily changed. And so we find ourselves in places where now, now we don't quite know what to do. When we find ourselves in moments where, where a relationship has gone sour, or, or the other person has hurt or said something to us that we didn't quite expect, and it, 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 it puts us in a place of not knowing how to respond. It even puts us in places where, where, we, where we make a decision without even thinking what might come on to the other side. We just jump in and make a decision, but we find ourselves in these moments where, where we kind of wish, oh, shoot, I wish I could go back and change some of those things. And we, we find ourselves in these patterns where we're now, as, as consumers in the world, these, these things shift into our, our minds as people. And we find ourselves in all these rhythms where, where we, we just don't know what to do. We thought that A, B, and C would, 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 would just continue us along, but, but when something else comes up, it, it, it throws us off, and, and we feel so disoriented and confused. And we find ourselves as people, as we work through life, that so much of the things are not as easy to fix, and we just don't know what to do, and we become a people who, who are more lost and anxious and depressed over the parts of our lives that don't go as we hoped, and, and we even more so that compounds because it can't be fixed so easily or undone. And so we find ourselves in the hardest parts of life, and they have gotten harder. And we feel it more so than ever at this time of the year. I was talking to a pastor the other day. The first Sunday of December, there's a, a gentleman who's coming to their church, and, and this is somebody who'd been in their church family for years, almost since the church started. He'd been there for so long, and he was so deeply involved, and I mean, he was a friend to everyone, and he was a friend to the pastor, and just a great relationship. Everyone knew him. Well, one Sunday they were gathering, talking about Christmas things and talking about family plans and all those things were being brought up. And, and then the next Sunday passed by, this would have been last Sunday, and, and, and the pastor noticed that the gentleman wasn't there. Asked around a little bit, do you know where this guy is? And no one knew, and he found out the following day that he had been in a motorcycle accident. And would go on to find out that this gentleman, his injuries were so, so devastating and destructive to his body that um, after a few days on life support, the family had to make a decision to take him off. And in the season of planning dinner gatherings, in the season of planning gifts for family member and people, then having to make this decision as a family. puts in perspective how things can change so fast. And we feel it this time of the year, if nothing's happened this year, but it's happened previous years, we, we feel it. And Christmas is supposed to be a time of hope. But for who? It seems like these words of Christmas being so full of joy and peace and hope have even in some ways become cliché. We sing them in songs, we have big letters in our front yard, we, we talk about them, we hear them on the radio, but, but if anything, it's like the weight of the world feels like it's just gotten heavier and it's pushed this, this sense of hope out of our life. And so as we gather looking at the manger, all we feel is heartache. All we feel is this confusion because things are not as we hope they be this time of the year. There's been chaos in our home. There's been things with job and money. There's been things in our marriage, things with our kids. And we come and we hope just for us to be one happy family. And we look to the manger hoping that that warm fuzziness just feels us. But, but it's like it's slipping away. And friends, perhaps what we need most this morning is to be deeply reminded of what the hope of Christ really is. Because the hope that is found in and through Jesus is so loosely held on to and so 
open-handedly receive, that perhaps maybe if we adjusted some of our life as we allowed the hope of God to cover and come into our life, then, then finally these things would actually be real. Wow, because we would need it to be, don't we, church? You see, as we spend time in the Christmas story, the, the Bible tells us that in Luke chapter 1, and Nate taught on this last Sunday, in Luke chapter 1, we see this moment where Mary, uh, she learns about what's happening, right? The Lord sends an angel to her. And, and this angel comes, and she's afraid, and she's like, don't worry. You know, he, he says, you know, don't worry, you are highly favored. And he explains to her what's going to happen and all these things. And, and we even, you know, talked last Sunday about how, how crazy and confusing that would be. But yet, yet she receives it all and goes to visit her relative, and all these things happen. And she writes a song in celebration, and all these things happen. But you see what's fascinating is that in the midst of all that, Joseph at one point finds out. Mary tells him, maybe before she visited Elizabeth or later on, but, but she tells this young man that she is engaged to what the angel of the Lord has shared with her. And you see, what's so important for us to understand is that Joseph's moment is so different than Mary's. Because an angel doesn't quite yet come to him. And even when the angel went to Mary, the angel never even said, listen, Joseph is going to respond and he's going to be all on board. And he's going to believe you. But as Mary shares this with him, he gets to this place of being so distraught. And I mean, he, he, I mean, could you imagine hearing this? I mean, he knows, he, he knows the Old Testament and he's a man who's faithful to God. But he says this is, he, he, you know, I imagine he's saying this is so impossible for this to happen and there's this moment where he kind of begins he begins to 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 kind of make this decision of how he's going to part ways from mary and he does so in a way that's respectful and it and, and the story begins to say this in matthew chapter 1 verse 20 it says this it says but after he had considered this an angel of the lord appeared to him in a dream and I want us to, to bite into that moment because understand, after he had made the decision of what to do, then God stepped in. It wasn't in the wrestling. It wasn't in the wave of information from Mary to him. It wasn't even in their dialogue and in their talking back and forth and back and forth. It was when he had already decided that he's going to do it this way. And I, I have to imagine that there's a part of the Lord that wanted to wait to see how Joseph would respond first. Because sometimes our response really gives an indication of our heart. Because when we respond in moments of great confusion and great heartache and hardship, and we respond with anger and bitterness, we reveal to God especially that we're closed. We're closed. But he, in a way, responds with almost this openness and this, this, this curiosity of, I just don't really know, and, and especially why. Why? And I have to imagine that in this moment, as he is wrestling with this news of, of what logically would just be his fiancé's unfaithfulness, he, in this moment, is, is showing the Lord that, that he is in a place of, of, of wanting to hear from God. That the point of his why is to understand, not just make his pain and frustration and confusion. No, he really was in a place of being open, especially to hearing from God. But we know what happens next. In the rest of the verse, it says this. It says that after he considered and the angel came and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. Wow. Do you know what's different about the moment where the angel shares with Mary 
for the child she would give birth to. In this moment where, where the angel shares with Joseph about this child that his fiance will give birth to. They both are told Jesus' name. The angel says to Mary, you'll give birth to, you know, uh, the son of the most high, and you'll give him the name Jesus, and yada, 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 yada. It's, the angel says all of that to her, but you know what's different in Joseph's moment? Is the angel tells him why. Why you'll name him Jesus. And, and perhaps we have lost, perhaps we are lost with, no essence of God's hope in our life because we have locked eyes with our misery and not the mystery of Jesus' hope for us. Because what's beautiful in this moment is is, is Joseph is is open-handed to what what God can have in his way in this moment. God tells him why. And what's beautiful, what is so remarkable in this moment is that is that he explains that this, this child who will be given the name Jesus because he will be the one who rescues humanity from their sin. He, this is incredible because what's fascinating, and you all know me, I'm kind of a, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a book person, I'm a tad bit of, of, of a nerd when it comes that way, and learning and studying and, 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 and just understanding even more. What's so remarkable is that the, the Greek name for Jesus is, is parallel with the, with the Hebrew name for Joseph. And in the Old Testament, there's only two people who have the name, I'm sorry, not Joseph, Joshua. The, the, the Greek parallel for Jesus' name is the, is the Hebrew parallel for, for the, the name Joshua. And in the Old Testament, there are two people who have the name Joshua. There's this man who's a priest. He's mentioned in the book of Zechariah. But the other one is the one who succeeds and comes behind Moses as the one who leads the people of God. He's the one when we spend time in Joshua, he says, be, be courageous, be brave, don't be afraid. Where the Lord tells him over and over again that I am with you. Be strong and courageous that the king of heaven is with you. Joshua is told this over and over again as he, as he stumbles into this leadership role of, of leading this massive million-plus group of people now into the promised land, across through the river, and into what they would soon can then kind of march around the walls of Jericho. And we know these stories, but, but understand that in this moment, Joshua is this man of the Old Testament who, who brings about the promises of God of finally entering into home. The people had heard for generations that the people will one day come home. And finally they did. And Joshua is their captain who led them into this salvation. And, and understand that Joshua is the symbol of mankind's hope in God. When all people were, were struggling in their faith and wondering if God is still with us, Joshua was this man who was brave and courageous. He was the symbol, the symbol of God's, God's got them and that he's with them. And you see what's beautiful is as Joshua is the symbol of mankind's hope in God, Jesus would be the arrival of God's hope for mankind. Because it would be just as the angel said, that Jesus himself would be the rescuer. It says that because he will save them. Joshua leads on behalf of the Lord who does the saving, but Joshua is just a vessel. But here in Matthew it says that Jesus himself will be the rescuer. Joshua is leading the people. They didn't belong to the Lord. They they didn't belong to him. They belonged to the Lord. And he led on behalf of the Lord. And in this moment, it says that Jesus will rescue his people. This beautiful moment in such a short sentence where the angel is making it so clear to Joseph who this child will be, that he will rescue his people. He will be the shepherd of his sheep, and he alone will be the Savior. And then for Joshua, he would lead the people into the promised land, and for Jesus, he would, he would be the one who would save them from their sin. The real problem. 
Not the Romans, not Caesar, not even uh, generational and historical problems like the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Persians or these other nations that they would go back to and say, you know, generations later, we're just a people who are struggling because of what happened way back there and we're just struggling today. And, and, and Jesus comes into the scene and he says, no, I am coming to, to rescue you from the real problem, the sin that is in your heart and in your soul. The selfishness, the rebelliousness, those elements of who we are that we live out against each other and against God. He says, I have come to take care of that. This is a powerful moment as the angel is speaking to, to Joseph and he shares, he shares this beautiful reality that, that Jesus' gift of hope would be given to humanity and that they would experience it and find it firstly through the Holy Spirit as, 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 as we have seen what lives out through Jesus' life and what he is pointing to. As Aaron said earlier, he's pointing to the cross. He's pointing to what, what God is still up to in the world. And what's so beautiful is he makes it so clear that he's come as, as the hero to rescue his people from their sin. And to bring about this, this pouring of the Spirit of God into their life that, that Jesus' gift of hope, my friends, would, be, would lead us, would lead us into finding it through the Holy Spirit as we would be a people who on the other side of, of finally being made right with God, that now the Spirit of God would, would be given inside of us. And so the parts of us that, that struggle with motivation is so important for us to understand as people who are walking with God. The part of us that is, that is underneath the flesh and bone, the part of us that, that frankly can, can detour our desires in our life can now be handed over to the presence of God and be made new. Wow. We'll lean a, a, a whole lot into that and into the new year as we spend time in our next small group series in, in February and March, and we'll le read in the book of Romans where it talks about being people who live by the Spirit and not by the flesh, because the Spirit leads us into life where our flesh leads us to death. So it's vital for us to understand when we are people, we have these natural tendencies to be unloving, to be impatient, to be angry, to be bitter, to be selfish, to be mean, to be vengeful, to be unforgiving, and those parts of our humanity, even though we know the Old Testament, we still give in to us. But now the Lord has brought about this new way where now the part that is deep inside of us, this, this inner self that's really steering the rudder of our life, can, can now be subject to God. And now when we're unmotivated to be selfless or selfish, we can come to the Lord and say, God, please, please change this part of me that I know is so driven by my flesh. I want it to be driven by your spirit, and now it can be changed and made new, and we become people who are genuinely loving in the world, and, and when we have people, when we're people with this deep pain that's rotting us to the core, now the presence of the spirit of God in our life can, can, can now do this healing work in our soul that leads us to be forgiving, that leads us to let go and move on. It allows us to be people who, especially when we've suffered loss, to grieve and be comforted by the presence of God. Wow. Over and over again, Scripture tells us that God is close to us, and when, when the Holy Spirit lives in us, He brings His, His hope that comes in the form of comfort. He, he covers us and blankets us with Himself. And we find ourselves in moments when we are so weak in life that we are now led into the strength of God. And I don't mean in the sense of us being able to kick down doors and, 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 and cry chop bricks, but I mean in the sense of, of being able to press on through the hardest, hardest of seasons and saying, Lord, you are my sustainer. You are the one that keeps me going. We find our hope through the Holy Spirit being present in our life and it's because of the baby that was born in a manger so long ago because of Christ that we can become people of God who are saved and redeemed and given the Spirit of God to live out the rest of our days this side of heaven. And what's so beautiful is, is that is a part of the hope that we are given, that Jesus' gift of hope 
uh, would, would lead us into finding hope in heaven, understanding that, that life here on earth is not the end for those of us who belong to God. That we're reminded as the joints start to fade, and we get out of bed and all of a sudden it's like, ah, oh, did you hear that pop? It's like, oh my goodness. Or, or it's like we stand up and we are, are hunched over and it takes us a minute to like get stood up and we need our spouse even to like straighten us out or something. We're people who are reminded that as our bodies are wearing away, that death is not the end. That we have a whole other life when we pass from here, we spend eternity in heaven with God. And the story that I shared earlier of the pastor and their church, they miss their friend dearly, but they know, they know he's with Jesus. <laughs> we find hope. We find hope in this reality that as we miss our loved ones this time of the year, that if they belong to God, we will see them again. That death isn't the end for those who believe in him. It is simply the beginning of a whole new life. And Jesus has given us, he's given us the hope of, of understanding that, that he will one day bring about a whole new heaven and a whole new earth. That Jesus' gift of hope would lead us, lead us into finding hope that he is going to bring about a new heaven and a new earth. That he is going to change all of what we see around us. And I'm not the only one in the room who sees what's happening overseas and sees what's happening in the world and we're afraid. And our, we're heartbroken for the evil that exists. The sheer evil, when we take our head out of the sand and we see the reality of the world around us, it is so dark. But the hope we have is knowing that God of heaven, he sees the evil just as he saw the evil in the day of Noah, he made a plan to flood the earth. Just in the days of Joshua and the Israelites conquering their nation, God saw the evil of all these other nations and the evil, the evil things that they would do, and God empowered and used the Israelites to wipe them off the face of the earth because they were so evil and wicked in their ways. The king of heaven sees the evil of the world today and he's already given us his plan. He's already told us that he will return. He will bring his justice. And he will take care of business. And he will bring about a new heaven and a new earth. He will change everything. That the evil we see in the world will not prevail in the, in the justice of our God and our King. And friends, understand as we as we grow in our life and we're, we're worried for our kids and our grandkids and generations and all these things, understand that the king of heaven sees it. And he's already told us his plan. And we will meet him in one of two ways. We'll meet him when we pass from this place and go to heaven or we'll meet him when he comes here again. And he made promises for thousands of years that he would come and nobody believed and he did. Missed it. Well, friends, I tell you right now, God has made promises that He will return. Don't miss it. We find hope in Christ in all of these ways and understand, understand that we have this hope not just by believing that God is real, but by trusting in Jesus. You know, what's so beautiful, what happens next in the story is the angel comes, he spends time with Joseph, he comes to him in a dream, he shares that, that you will name this child Jesus. And they are already, he, and just in that alone, he gets an idea of who this, who this baby will grow into be. But then he is told why. He's told that because he will rescue his people from their sin. But then Joseph is put in a moment whether to trust. And you see in Matthew 1, it says this next, and this is probably one of the more understood and, 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 and memorized parts of the Christmas story. But there's actually great significance in what comes next. Let me explain, but let's read it first. 
It says in verse 22, all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Biblical scholars are torn in one of two ways. Either the writer Matthew adds that in as, as, a, as a narrating of the story. Or it is a moment where when Joseph wakes up, he is reminded of something that's actually very near and dear to his family's history. You see, because what happens in, in, in Joseph's lineage, his great, great, great grandfather, 15 generations earlier, Ahaz, he's the king of Judah, and this is the time of the Old Testament where, 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 where the nation is torn in two and, and there's the kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel that's running away from God and there's the southern kingdom that's trying to stay close. And, and uh, Joseph's great, great, great grandfather 15 generations earlier, King Ahaz, becomes king of Judah. And he comes into this place where, where he's kind of, he's so deeply afraid. He's so deeply afraid uh, because he hears that these other nations are coming to conquer them. And instead of seeking the Lord for help, he decides in his own wisdom to, to uh, he decides to bribe these other nations to attack the northern kingdom. He says, go, go destroy them. Leave us alone. We're, 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 we're going to just keep to ourselves. We're, we're helpless. We're defenseless. Don't worry about us. We're no threat to you. And he gives them a bunch of money, and he says, go destroy them instead and leave us alone. You see, Isaiah the prophet in chapter 7 sees what's happening. And he goes to the king and says, why didn't you ask God for direction of what to do? And he says, ah, I didn't want to bother God. I didn't want to petty the Lord. And he says, you liar, you liar, you you were a coward. You did not trust the Lord. You wanted nothing to do with him. And you see, what happens is in Isaiah chapter 7, Isaiah in this moment speaks, and he tells the king the promise that he would have been given if he had listened to God. It says in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, it says, Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. And he says this, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Joseph was put in a place like his great, great, great grandfather of wrestling. Am I really going to trust the Lord? Or am I going to lean into my own ways? And you see, what is so essential in our journey to understand is that the hope that we find in Christ, understand, it is only found in our willingness to trust him. I love what Joseph does next, because what next happened, what, as he ends the story after what we read in 23, it says this in 24, it says, When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but she did not, you know, he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. He trusted the angel of the Lord. And friends, understand that the hope that Jesus gives us is found through our willingness to trust him. Understand that. We can't just casually speak it into existence and claim it in some sort of way. We have to anchor ourselves to Christ and say, it is in you alone that I have the hope of the world. I have the hope that sustains me. I have the hope that, that whatever I'm facing, that I know that the Lord's got it and that he is with me, that the Holy Spirit is in me. Hope knowing that while our body is in age, uh, maybe even failing us, that, that our soul will live for eternity, knowing that, that, that the Lord, that the evil we see every day, that, that the Lord sees it too, and he is not okay with it, and that he'll bring his justice. Understand, friends, that we have to 